we typically focus on grades and scores and getting into great schools. And we want our children, our future, to have great opportunities and to be successful. But I think um, uh, but I think we're we're aiming for the wrong things. The goals like getting to an elite school are really, if you take a step back, surrogates, um, replacements for for the things that we're really after. Um, for this thing that we call success. And so then the question becomes, what is success? And while I think that each of you, each of us, needs to define that for ourselves, I, I will tell you what I think. And this is a work in progress. I think success is finding what nourishes you and fills you up in a way that allows you to nourish others. And sometimes great test, or, test scores may, may correlate with that kind of success. Um, but I think focusing on those things is easy and lets us off the hook for, uh, from defining what's really important to us. So, so if you're a young person, uh, by the way, all of us are, um, that's that's a state of, of, of attitude, um, not not chronologically defined necessarily, and and you want to do the right thing, you want to be successful, and there's not an easily measurable, predefined path. What to do? So I have a suggestion, and the suggestion is to be curious and and act on that curiosity. And one really liberating thing about framing it that way is that it's okay if you're wrong. You just adjust your aim a little bit and, and follow where your curiosity leads you. Now, if it turns out you find something that you are so curious about that you have to learn everything about it and you want to teach everyone else about it because you think it's going to make the world a better place, you think it's going to make them happy to know about it, then you've got it made. And I think I've got it made. And I want to tell you a little bit about my journey so far, uh, hopefully in a way that's, uh, that's instructive. So when I was um, in my teens and, and early in college, um, I was curious about a lot of things. Uh, but it turned out that what I was most curious about was what we often call molecular biology. It's okay if you're not curious about it. Um, and this was last century, last millennium even. And, and at the time, we were just beginning to really understand how changes in our DNA affected how our body uh, interacts with things like cancer. And so... I decided that there was nothing more interesting that I could do than to study this field and try to unlock more of those mysteries and, as a result, hopefully help reduce some of the suffering from those diseases. So I spent many hours uh, in a laboratory looking under microscopes, and it was pretty interesting, but I didn't love it. Okay, it was kind of boring. Um, it was really lonely. And so I, I had to readjust my aim a little bit. And uh, I was in Southern California at the time, and I took a, a volunteer job as a translator at a clinic that was mostly for Spanish-speaking immigrants. I, my family is from Chile, and I grew up speaking both English and Spanish. And that first day in the clinic, I was in the middle of conversations about feelings and fears and symptoms and diagnoses and treatments. And it was amazing. And I thought, holy cow, um, I could do science and people at the same time. So I shifted my aim and I went to medical school. 
And this was in the mid 1990s. And while some parts of the world, especially around here, were zooming ahead into the te technological future, the world of medicine was not yet. And, um, and so the people that were teaching me wanted to memorize a lot of things. And I'm not a great memorizer. And so I wanted someone to teach me how to talk to people in a certain way and how to solve problems in ways that I didn't know how to solve problems yet. And then how to look things up when I needed to look them up. Like the name of that bone in the middle of your wrist. Um, and, and so I adjusted my focus again and um, moved, moved the telescope just a little bit turned the dial, and I ended up somewhat accidentally developing two parallel paths or careers. Um, I became a, a physician, and, uh, and I still get to see patients part-time. And I also studied how computing and the internet can dramatically change the way that we help people be as healthy as they can. And I uh, ended up with a job at Google, and I spent a lot of time studying the health questions that people put into the Google search box. Talk about curiosity. And, and I started to see something really interesting. People weren't just asking what's wrong with me, but they were also asking, is there anyone else that has the same things wrong with them? And so changed my aim again. And for the last several years, I've spent my time building online communities for patients and families who are affected by a whole variety of illnesses. And this is the most interesting thing I've ever done. Um, I grew up and trained in a healthcare system that was very much designed to imagine that doctors and the system around the doctors figure out what the right answer is and then deliver, we even talk about healthcare delivery, deliver that answer to the patient and family. And, and we assume that that's really the work that needs to be done. But there's a huge piece that's missing there. We're not thinking about all the people around that patient beyond just the family. What, what I very generally refer to as as the community. And for those of you that have had experience yourself or with a loved one with serious illness, one of the things that it makes me think about is that being a person, being human, can be very lonely. And being sick often makes us lonelier. And, and so when we deliver health care, I think it needs to be delivered in the context of community and helping to address the loneliness that's part, often part of the suffering. And there's a really important secret, the most interesting secret I've figured out so far, is that I believe that most of us are, are wired to want to help others. And the reason many of us don't do that, at least not in a very explicit way with a lot of our time, is because it's hard. Oh gosh, I'd like to volunteer, but I'm so busy. And so one of the secrets uh, of... The, the value of the peer support systems that I get to work on these days is that the people offering the help, offering the peer support, I think often get as much or even more value as the people receiving it. And so now what I'm doing is I'm spending a lot of time convincing doctors and the healthcare systems where they work to prescribe peer support as a complement to the more traditional forms of medicine. And sometimes we run into barriers. So I'm going to read this to you in case it's not um, uh, that visible. This is uh, from a wonderful book called How to Behave and Why from 1946. It makes for hilarious bedtime reading. And this is one page that I particularly like. Doctors and scientists study and learn what is the best way to keep ourselves healthy. Our fathers and mothers, not the order there, learn from them, and they tell us, they know a lot more than we do. And if we are bright, we do what they tell us to. <laughs> so, 
So I don't completely agree with what's written on this page. And like we saw yesterday in the March of Our Lives activity across the country, while some change is frustratingly slow, it's often unstoppable. And there's inspiration for it all around us. Every day I'm inspired by hundreds of conversations in the ovarian cancer community and the postpartum depression community and the people affected by Parkinson's disease and diabetes, and I learn so much from them and um, get nourished in a way that allows me to try to nourish others. That's just my little world. There's, um, there's a big world out there, and this is a picture from uh, Malawi in southeastern Africa in a rural town. And the man in the red hat, uh, he's, he's had a stroke. And the one time that the physical therapist, there's only a few physical therapists in the country, was able to visit his home after his visit to the hospital, that therapist struggled to help him recover because uh, she needed some equipment to help teach him how to do his therapy. And so his neighbors, they were around. It's a very friendly neighborhood. Um, and they said, how might we help? And so over the next couple of days, they built a gym on the side of his house and learned from the physical therapist how to be his therapist and help him do his exercises for every day, for months. And, and the reality is, if we think about this just specifically in healthcare, which is most of, most of what my brain activity focuses on, doctors can't solve problems alone. We, we pretend that's the case. Um, that was certainly part of the ideal scenario that I had in my, my mind as I uh, worked to become a doctor. But in most cases, it literally requires a community to solve hard and important problems. And this, this interconnectedness between community and well-being was on display um, a couple of weeks ago at a, at a museum, an exhibit in, at De Anza College, not too far from here, about family caregivers. And this is a picture that I took of a painting, um, a, a series of paintings by an artist called Brett Cook, where he celebrates local change makers in the community, in this case in Oakland, by putting line drawings of these activists and putting them in public with supplies so that passers-by can help create the final image by adding color to the line drawings. And this community activist, her name is Nicole Lee, said, as the quote says uh, at the top of the slide, healing is getting to the root of suffering and transforming that into something else. Now, unexpectedly, if we zoom in and turn the painting on its side, um, one of the community members not only added color, but added some wisdom, a Samoan proverb that says, we are moved by love, but never driven by intimidation. Now, the specifics of the context of healthcare or uh, this particular uh, piece of, of ancient wisdom are not necessarily as important as the fact that each of us has this unlimited set of opportunities in front of us. My success so far, I suspect the aim will need to be adjusted a couple times further, um, has been at the intersection of community and health because of the nourishment that it gives me. And I'll continue to follow my curiosity. Um, a lot of my curiosity these days has to do with my children, um, uh, one of whom is is back there taking furious notes, I'm sure. And, and we now have before us arguably more opportunities, more possibilities than any generations have ever had by far. And I think with that comes uh, an equally daunting responsibility. Um, we need each of you to find what nourishes you and to figure out how to use that nourishment to support all the other people in our communities that are inextricably connected with you. 
And I suggest that you don't worry about getting it exactly right, because you will be able to adjust your aim and, and adjust the focus when you need to. Just be curious. Thank you.